Harry's Wife, A Less Than Royal Narcissist, Part 50.1. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. Well, we have quite the range of information that has been provided through news channels about Harry's wife and her world, which bears analysis, enabling you to understand the various behaviours, to understand why things have been said, the motivation behind them, and also to extend, of course, your knowledge about narcissism more generally. As always, I leave it to you to make a determination about the veracity of the relevant reports. I'm providing you with an analysis so that you understand what is actually going on. To begin with, we go to the mirror, which tells us the following. Harry's wife felt shunted off in Nottingham Cottage, away from Kensington Palace. If only Harry's wife had visited the House of Tudor, which would have enabled her to have bolstered her authenticity with a range of interesting merchandise appertaining to the chickens of authenticity and, of course, the reliable bananas of empowerment. Obtaining such wonderful merchandise would have clearly dealt with that unpleasant sensation of being shunted off. And if you're feeling a little shunted off, dear listeners, then go to the video description, pop into the House of Tudor, and perk yourself up by demonstrating your true credentials with some authenticity of the chicken variety, or empower yourself with those bananas. You might also find yourself intrigued to demonstrate that you're applying the principle of go-so, or various other goodies appertaining to the world of narcissism. Go and have a look. Anyway, returning to the Mirror article, author Tom Quinn, who he, uh, said he believes the Duchess of Sussex would have initially been drawn in by the fantasy of the royal family, but became unhappy with hers and Prince Harry's living situation. Harry's wife felt shunted off when she was asked to stay in Nottingham, College, Nottingham Cottage and not Kensington Palace, it is claimed. Author Tom Quinn said he believes the Duchess of Sussex would have initially been drawn in by the fantasy of the royal family. Well, a narcissist would be drawn in by the prominence associated with the world's most famous royal family because it would aid the facade. It would also contain certain residual benefits such as money, access to other individuals, access to networks. It would also prove to be useful with regard to the assertion of control, as joining such an organisation, the firm, would enable the assertion of control not only over a small group of individuals, but more widely through the general public and the media. And therefore, the opportunity to join the royal family proves a very tempting carrot indeed to any narcissist. And whilst author Tom Quinn believes that the fantasy of the royal family would have drawn, drawn Harry's wife in, indeed consciously it may well have done, as we know, as one is dealing with an unaware narcissist, it is the unconscious desire for the prime aims which will have caused the royal family to look so attractive. The article continues, but once she and Prince Harry settled into married life, she became disappointed living in a little cottage, he claimed. Now, of course, there are two aspects there. The first is that that may well have been part of the sustained devaluation that Prince Harry finds himself in. So, for example, when you're in the seduction period as an intimate partner primary source, and prior to that as the intimate partner secondary source, everything about you is really good. So, for example, if you have a large nose and you say to the narcissist, oh, I'm a little bit conscious about my nose, I think it's rather, you know, it's a bit on the big side, the narcissist is likely to respond by saying, oh, no, nothing to worry about, or may even go so far as to pour some flattery in your direction by stating things such as, you have a wonderful nose, an imperious nose, a noble nose. But then when you're in the sustained devaluation, the presence of your large nose is used against you. You're called Pinocchio, big nose. You look like a witch, and that's because anything about you, when in the golden period, is viewed in a white light, a benign way, and when you're in devaluation, 
Everything about you is viewed through that lens of being painted black. The good becomes the bad. The bad becomes the good. It will shift dependent upon whether you're painted white or whether you're painted black. Everything is viewed through that perspective. There is no constancy. Now, for instance, you might have been engaged with an artist who would come round to your house and would say, oh, I like your house. Although it's on the small side, it's cosy. I, I feel safe here. I really like the uh, warmth that's generated. And then all of a sudden, when you're in the devaluation, you find the narcissist doesn't want to come round because they say, oh, it's a bit pokey at your house. Um, the shower isn't big enough for me. There isn't a full-length mirror for me to look in. And you're thinking to yourself, what are you talking about? You never complained about those things before. You talked about its warmth and its coziness. The simple fact is that the attributes of your property are viewed favourably in the golden period and then are viewed unfavourably when you're in the sustained devaluation. So if what Mr Quinn says is accurate, the comments may well have arisen as a consequence of the fact that Harry's now in devaluation and therefore everything associated with him, including the place that they're living in, is Port Scorn on. Of course, it may also be the case that even if Harry hadn't entered devaluation then, the fact that they live in what is seen as a little cottage is used to triangulate Harry in a way to say, we deserve somewhere better to live. We should have a larger property. And of course, the envious narcissist only has to look around at who else lives nearby, William and Kate, and see that they have a more well-appointed property, a larger property, that that would offend Harry's wife's sense of control. And therefore, in order to deal with that threat to control, comment has to be made about the property to Harry, triangulating him with it by saying, we should be living somewhere better. The article continues, Two-bedroom Nottingham Cottage was the couple's first marital home, located on the grounds of Kensington Palace. Dubbed Not Cot, it served as a base for the pair until they moved to Frogmore Cottage and later to California. Mr Quinto, the Mirror's Pod Save the Queen podcast, that he thinks Harry's wife would have been unhappy with their first home. I think that actually she wasn't too keen on that, he said. It seemed like they were being shunted off to a little prefab in the grounds. And a narcissist is very much likely to see the property in that vein by regarding it as beneath them, beneath the status, and therefore it would feel like a threat to control. The article continues, Harry had lived in Nottingham Cottage described as snug since 2013 with Harry's wife, joining him just before their engagement. But contrary to Mr Quinn's claims, authors Carolyn Durand and the improbably named Omid Scobie say Harry's wife was happy in the property. Writing in Finding Dollars, and as reported by the Daily Express, they said, After months of long distance, Harry's wife was thrilled to finally be sharing a postcode, W84PY, with her partner. Note the grandiosity of that statement, sharing a postcode, not a property, a postcode. Look at me, I'm so vast and important, I have a postcode to share. And of course, these are the voices of the members of the coterie and the improbably named Omid Scobie as a lieutenant, there to assert control as the mouthpieces of the narcissist. The article continues with their comments. She felt at home at Not Cot with Harry. She's always been able to bloom where she was planted. But she hadn't moved to London to start a new job. Well, there we have it. The, the flowers of blooming. The fact that Harry's wife, wherever she is planted, she is able to bloom. Now, of course, first of all, saying that is demonstrative, of course, of the propaganda that is being put forward by a member of the coterie and a lieutenant for the purposes of assertion of control on behalf of the narcissist, but also it encapsulates the chameleon-like ability of many narcissists, not necessarily all, but many narcissists, to adapt to the situation that they're placed in, in order to achieve the prime aims. And therefore, whilst it is a compliment which is being done to portray Harry's wife in, in a good light, the fact remains that the observation, if accurate, and it probably is, 
of demonstrating that Harry's wife is able to bloom wherever she is planted demonstrates the flexibility, the chameleon-like powers of the narcissist to take any situation and turn it to our advantages. The article continues. But Harry and his wife didn't stay in Nottingham Cottage for long and soon moved to Frogmore Cottage in Windsor, reportedly to get away from the pressures of life in London. More likely, that was seen as a move upward status-wise, and therefore that would accord more with the image of the narcissist, again by asserted control through grandiosity. But Mr Quinn claims that too, that too became an unhappy arrangement, as Harry's wife suddenly realised it was like living in the Russian steppe. The author of Kensington Palace, an intimate memoir from Queen Mary to Harry's wife, added she was away from everything. And therefore, that sense of isolation by being at Frogmore Cottage would present difficulties with regard to the extraction of fuel. If there was a lack of prominence in terms of being seen, that affects status, fuel provision and control. And therefore, being tucked away at Frogmore Cottage would not have accorded with what the prime aims required from the narcissist. And therefore, as a combination of the innate grandiosity in terms of status, and of course, as I've explained previously, the need to pull Harry away from those that might influence control over him, the move eventually to the 217 bathroom, I believe it is, or is it 16? Either way, far too many bathrooms for just two people. Uh, mansion in Montecito occurred. The Sussexes, of course, have now settled in California, the article explains, in a sprawling multi-million dollar mansion with chicken coop after they quit royal life, and in February when TV host James Corden, arsehole, joked that the pair should move into the lavish mansion from the sitcom The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Harry's wife replied, I think we've moved enough. And this article demonstrates how a property can be utilised in terms of threatening the control of the narcissist because it's linked to status, how it can be used by the narcissist to triangulate with other individuals for the purposes of assertion of control, the fact that it plays a part with regard to prominence, which is also linked to the assertion of control. And again, we also see a a uh, fleeting visit from a coterie member and a lieutenant with regard to the assertion of control on behalf of the narcissist. So even this short article, uh, whether it's accurate or not, um, provides us with insight with regard to, on either side, whether she was happy or she wasn't happy, whichever way that you look at it, provides us with useful insight with regard to the workings of the narcissist. In part two, I'll be turning to a different aspect of the narcissistic dynamic pertaining to Harry's wife as covered by the news outlets. Join me there.